Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Sputnik V. All vaccines that have been in the news a lot lately, and rightfully so. With all that has been going on in the world, our only hope of saving lives and returning to a more normal way of living will be once most people are vaccinated. But there is something I was overlooking during all this news on vaccines that I wanted to talk about. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are mRNA type vaccines. And if you were like me, you might have just skimmed over that part, or not known exactly what it means. But it is actually a very important piece to know. One that has future potential for eradicating other diseases and even certain types of cancers. Hi, I'm your host Andrew, and welcome to an Andrew and Zari video. What are mRNA type vaccines? Well, first, we need to take a look at where vaccines started. The first recognized vaccine was developed in 1796 by British doctor Edward Jenner, and it was developed to fight against smallpox. The idea behind this vaccine was to use cowpox material to create immunity to smallpox, something he discovered when observing milkmaids that had contracted cowpox suddenly could not be infected with smallpox. Cowpox was a mild disease found in cows, and Edward discovered that this disease actually created an immunity to smallpox. A short side note, he also coined the term vaccine, as it stems from the Latin word for cow, vaxa. Anyway, this method quickly became widespread in the fight against smallpox, but we didn't see another major breakthrough for vaccines until almost a hundred years later when Louis Pasteur developed the rabies vaccine in 1885. From there on, the 1930s saw vaccines for bacterial infections like tetanus and tuberculosis. Throughout the 1950s and onwards, we saw vaccines for diseases such as polio and measles, mumps, and rubella be developed to what we see nowadays with many of these vaccines and more. Over 200 years since Edward Jenner stumbled onto the first vaccine, there have been many advancements in vaccine technology, directly leading to the eradication of diseases like smallpox and polio. It is no wonder why vaccines are considered one of the greatest medical advancements of the modern era. Now, to understand how vaccines work though, we must look at how our bodies fight illness. When our bodies are infected by bacteria or viruses, our immune system starts to retaliate by sending white blood cells to fight the infection. The types of white blood cells are broken down into granulocytes, lymphocytes, and monocytes. This is a very complex topic on its own, and the important takeaway for now should be that each white blood cell has a different role and they all work together in fighting off an infection, whether it be viral or bacterial. This process can take several days for your body to begin, and if an infection is successfully eradicated, your immune system can now respond accordingly when encountering it in the future. It does this by sending out specific memory cells to produce antibodies that already know how to fight the specific infection. Congratulations, you now have immunity to insert disease here. Traditional vaccines like the MMR vaccine help your body develop immunity by imitating an infection. The important part here being to imitate, which causes your body to react and send out white blood cells, but does not actually infect your body with the potentially deadly disease. Your body goes through a simulated effort in attacking an infection, and will now have the memory cells to know how to fight the infection quickly in the future if you were to ever contract the actual disease. Going back to Edward Jenner and the first smallpox vaccine over 200 years ago, he used cowpox, a much milder version of smallpox, to which a body's immune system could practice and learn how to fight so that when its bigger brother smallpox came, your immune system already knew how to defeat it. This concept was the basis for traditional vaccines, to use a weakened version of a bacteria or virus to teach the immune system. While this worked very well, there are still advancements to be made, and that is exactly what has happened with DNA and mRNA vaccines. mRNA vaccines, and we will group DNA vaccines into this as well, while having the same end goal as traditional vaccines, will use a different method for providing immunity. Instead of injecting a weakened version of the virus, mRNA vaccines deliver a message to the cells that stimulates an immune response. The message being delivered is a set of genetic instructions, based on the original bacteria or virus. You can look at it like biological software. 
with the mRNA being programmed and then uploading genetic code for your cells to actually make the specific protein themselves, for your immune system to then fight against in practice. Therefore, have immunity to in the future, just like with a traditional vaccine. The only difference being the RNA vaccine is now teaching the immune system to respond to infections without having to use a weakened version of the disease. The technology that makes this possible started around the 1990s and has incrementally been advancing since. But the reason why it is such a big deal now is because the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are the first mass-produced vaccines using RNA. RNA and DNA methods for vaccinations are also theoretically quicker and cheaper to develop than traditional protein vaccines because the time spent developing a reduced version of the disease or viral protein in a lab, which can sometimes take years, is no longer needed. Instead, it is only the time spent cracking the genetic code that is the deciding factor. So, having a more adaptable vaccine, especially when you need to mass produce them during a global pandemic, are huge benefits, but they are not the only benefits of this new technology. The benefits of RNA and DNA vaccines can also extend outside of the current global crisis to other diseases that were previously untreatable with traditional vaccines or other methods. The future of RNA vaccines looks bright. Other than the human trials currently happening for rabies, influenza, and HIV, which is already an impressive list, there is also potential for diseases like malaria and hepatitis B to be targeted by RNA vaccine technology. A key factor to some of its potential also lies in the versatility that the RNA vaccine process offers. Consider something like influenza, where the strain is constantly mutating. A traditional vaccine development cycle cannot keep up with the ever-changing flu. Hence why the flu shot given out every year is essentially just trying to guess what the most prominent strain of the flu will be and provide immunity for that. RNA vaccines are quick enough to develop that they would be able to actually protect against the dominant flu strains every year. On top of the potential diseases, RNA technology might also be able to add beating certain types of cancers to the list too. I know, I know, that is a very bold statement, but the technology has the potential. How this could be done is by personalizing each RNA vaccine to the specific individual. By using samples taken from a tumor, the genetic code could be injected into a cancer patient to teach their immune system how to fight against the specific cancer they have. Now, while this may all look promising, it should also be mentioned the potential drawbacks when using RNA and DNA vaccines. With a DNA method, there is a risk of permanently modifying a cell's genetic sequence, something that an RNA vaccine does not do, as it only acts as a messenger. While the risks are low for a DNA vaccine to do this, it is still a possibility and probably explains why there are currently no human uses of a DNA vaccine to date. RNA vaccines do sound like the better option here, but there is still a lot of research and development that is needed. We only saw the synchronized effort and quick release of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine because of the global pandemic we are in. Who knows if this same effort will translate beyond that. Although, it certainly showed the potential of RNA vaccine technology, with its rapid development and high effectiveness, which could be the first of many new life-saving vaccines to come. This video is only scratching the surface in terms of technical details, and is a very simplified explanation on vaccines and immune response, because frankly, I'm not an epidemiologist or an immunologist. We always encourage you to research things yourself and to have some trust in the scientific community and process when it matters. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. If you have questions or suggestions for future videos, please leave us a comment. We will read all of your comments. Thank you, and we will see you on the next one.